And if I go to sensitive history, well, then I must quote sources that say it rather than that I say it. This is a fascinating book, and the web pages are there. You can check it out. Facts are facts. This is a book that was written by a Jewish man. And he confronted the thinking of many of the high-placed individuals of the world. This is interesting stuff. In this book, Benjamin H. Friedman, a Jewish man, writes about the Jews and reveals an interesting history. He states that the present Jews in Palestine are not the true descendants of the Judeans, but rather descendants of the Khazars. In the letter addressed to D. David Goldstein of Boston, Massachusetts, a convert to Catholicism, the author, Benjamin Friedman of New York City, dated October 1954, provides some fascinating insights. This is in the public domain. Let's study this for a while and see where we get. Benjamin H. Freeman claims that the word Jew was only introduced into the English language in the 18th century and that Jesus referred to himself as a Judean and not as a Jew. Inscribed upon the cross when Jesus was crucified were the Latin words Iesus Nazarenus Rex Iodeorum, which means Jesus of Nazareth, ruler of the Judeans. Now this is fascinating. I went and checked it. And it is so. <laughs> yes, it happens to be so. Now the word Jew today has a religious as well as a political connotation. You think of a Jewish entity, a government, but you also think of their religion incorporated at the same time, whereas the term Judean is a geographic connotation. It's a geographic. It doesn't incorporate the religion. It's where he came from. He was from Judah. He was a Judean. He further writes, the form of religious worship known as Phariseeism in Judea in the time of Jesus was a religious practice based exclusively upon the Talmud. The Talmud in the time of Jesus was the Magna Carta, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, all rolled into one of those who practiced Phariseeism. The Talmud today occupies the same relative position with respect to those who profess Judaism. So the rituals and rites that many of them observed were based on the Talmud and not on the Torah. Rabbi Morris, this is all from the source. Rabbi Morris in Kurtzer wrote a most revealing and comprehensive article with the title, What is a Jew? which was published as a feature article in Look magazine in June 17, 1952 issue. In that article, Rabbi Morris Kotze evaluated the significance of the Talmud to Judaism today. In that illuminating treatise and that important subject, by the most qualified authority at the time, Rabbi Morris N. Kurtzer stated, the Talmud consists of 63 books of legal, ethical, and historical writings of the ancient rabbis. It was edited five centuries after the birth of Jesus. It is a compendium of law and lore. It is the legal code which forms the basis of the Jewish religious law, and it is, note, the textbook used in the training of rabbis. So rabbis are trained according to the Talmud. And the Talmud has very little in common with the Bible. And then he states, From the birth of Jesus until this day, there have never been recorded more vicious and vile, libelous blasphemies of Jesus or Christians and the Christian faith by anyone, anywhere, or any time than you will find between the covers of the infamous 63 books, which are the legal code which forms the basis of the Jewish religious law as well as the textbook used in the training of rabbis. 
I don't want to go into it. If I were to put the quotes on the screen, which the Talmud contains about Jesus, you would be horrified. It is some of the vilest statements that I have ever had the dishonor of reading. And this is what their training consists of. He then proceeds to quote some of the most horrendous statements from the Talmud regarding ethical issues, and not only regarding ethical issues, which deal with many, many issues from economics to relations with women, etc., and, of course, the view on Christ. As to the origin of the present Jews in Palestine, he states that those Jews derived from Eastern Europe and many, many of the Jews that today live in the reconstituted state of Israel come from Eastern Europe are not descendants of the Judeans or the lost tribes of Israel, but rather descendants of the Khazars. Who were they? They were a nation most people do not even know of. He writes, the so-called self-styled Jews in Eastern Europe in modern history cannot legitimately point to a single ancient ancestor who ever set even a foot on the soil of Palestine in the era of Bible history. Research also revealed that the so-called or self-styled Jews in Eastern Europe were never Semites, are not Semites now, nor can they ever be regarded as Semites at any future time by any stretch of the imagination. What secret mysterious power has been able for countless generations to keep the origin and the history of the Khazars and the Khazar kingdom out of the history textbooks? Did you ever learn about it at school? I never learned about it. And out of classroom courses in history throughout the world, the origin and the history of Khazars and the Khazar kingdom are certainly incontestable historical facts. You have to do some cross-checking. Even the Jewish encyclopedia is quite explicit about it. This was the Khazar kingdom. Here is the Black Sea, the Byzantine Empire, here was Persia, and here was the kingdom of the Khazars. It was a massive kingdom. Now let's look at some of this interesting history. The Khazars were an Asiatic nation, and the Jewish encyclopedia states Persian origin that converted to Talmudic Judaism. Now obviously some of the rabbis involved there could have been Judeans and probably were Judean descendants, but their converts are not Judeans. And that had conquered a vast area of Eastern Europe, which was in turn later conquered by the Russians in the 10th and 13th century. So that is why there are so many Russian Jews. Have you ever thought where they came from? Did they escape from Palestine? Were they the lost 10 tribes? Did they emigrate to Russia? No. This is a totally different nation that accepted Talmudic Judaism. Judaism. He writes... After a historic session with representatives of the three monotheistic religions, King Bulan, 7th century, 7th century, decided against Christian and Islam, because Islam had just arisen, just arisen, and selected as the future state religion the religious worship then known as Talmudism, and not known and practiced as Judaism was totally different, which was based on the Bible. They adopted the Hebrew alphabet and the Khazars adapted words to their requirements from the German, the Slavonic, and the Baltic languages. This language was known as Yiddish. And Yiddish used the Hebrew alphabetic characters, but not Hebrew. It's not Hebrew. It's Yiddish. I've always wondered... When I hear them speaking Yiddish, I understand quite a few words. Why? Because I'm German. 
They had many exchanges with universities and their students were trained. So here is another nation which had occupied this area and they had adopted this religion and brought rabbis in and trained the people, but they were not Judean. Now let's jump to today in accordance to this history. The religion of the modern state of Israel is based on Kabbalistic and Talmudic traditions and is far removed from the biblical worship of Yahweh. And if it is based on the Talmud, it is so anti-Jesus Christ that it belies understanding. And here we have, in March 2006, while visiting Yeshiva University at Brooklyn, New York, a Jewish institute dedicated to the study of the what? Talmud. We have Cardinal Kasper. Who is Cardinal Kasper? Cardinal Kasper is the cardinal associated with ecumenism. They are honoring the Talmud together. You see, behind the scenes, there is a pact. Because I, as a Christian, can sympathize with every other religion, but I cannot embrace a religion that speaks evil of Jesus Christ. Nor can I have a union with such a religion. Because can two walk together lest they be agreed? Now let's get back to the Napoleonic Nope Society and see what happened further. Napoleon established both the Bank of France, we saw that, the French Bourse, the Stock Exchange, as well as the National Department of Tax Boards. Do we have all of those systems of governments in the world today, yes or no? Yes, we do. And we have the same system of economics today, yes or no? Yes. It's run, the world is run by the Stock Exchange. To ensure equitable taxation for all, consequently the income of the French peasants skyrocketed. Think tanks and research tenses were established in France to work on projects vital for national economy. So a totally new economic order evolved. Who started these organizations? We will have to see. Who runs the secret societies today and the secret organizations? Who started them? Who is the instigator? Who's the boss behind the scenes? We will have to see. And maybe we'll get a different picture of what's happening in the world. An industrial board was organized to provide data and information to French industry as exemplified by the success of the sugar beet farming and the canning industry. In the military, Napoleon pioneered in what we describe today as the principles of war. And did you know that these principles, the armies of today are based on the organization created by Napoleon for his grand army and it has been used ever since. Who controls these armies? Who controls the war machines of the world? Who controls the gun running? These are important questions. And now it gets interesting. Napoleon disappears. He says, I want a Jewish state. I want to rebuild the Jewish temple. What is he planting in the mines? An idea. He starts the lodges. The British lodges start taking over these lodges eventually. Of course, they're all integrated. And then Prussia, when Napoleon is gone, retracted the liberal laws in 1815 after the Battle of Waterloo. The worst setback was inflicted upon the Jews of the Papal States. It would almost seem as if Pius VII had taken revenge on the Jewish population of his territory for the humiliation he had suffered at the hand of Napoleon. He was not content with their confinement behind the walls of the re-erected ghetto, but he obliged the Jews to wear the yellow badge. The Jews had to walk with a badge, with an armband. Does that ring a bell somewhere? In Sardina, the Jews were thrown back into ghettos and not allowed to build synagogues. 
Much later, some European nations assimilated the Jews between 1824 and 1867, and Holland in 1830. These are Protestant nations. They don't understand what's going on. They're trying to help the Jews. Sweden, 1834, Switzerland, 1838. It is remarkable that in England, it was only in 1858, after Lord R Lionel Rich Rothschild was elected five times, that he was permitted to take his seat in Parliament. It is also interesting to know that the laws that were passed in France in 1808 are still in existence even to this day. So there was liberty on the one hand, but oppression started to take over in Europe. And by the time we get to Adolf Hitler, did he introduce the same oppression, yes or no? Yes, he hounded them. He disenfranchised them. And the Russians, all of these nations, suddenly the world was in turmoil in war and the Jews were the hounded ones. And at the end of this war, where would those poor Jews go when they to try to escape the turmoil of Europe? Where did they go? They were herded like sheep to a new Jewish state in order to create a new philosophy which was to be swallowed hook, line, and sinker by a world with a totally new religious philosophy, no longer based on Protestantism, but now based on new Catholic counter-theology. Have you ever thought about it? That the British, who were the saviors of Europe, allowed ships to be filled with Jewish hopefuls who wanted to emigrate to the West, how they wouldn't let those ships pass by, and how eventually they were all herded towards Palestine and the Jews had to settle in a land that had nothing? Well, it's interesting. You have to create a, a national identity. You have to create national heroes. And we dealt with that in previous lectures. I don't want to go into it. And eventually, where did they end up? They ended up the leaders of the nations. And a new nationality arose, and a new nationalistic, Zionistic pride arose, and a nation arose. I feel sorry for them. They have been hounded and herded. It is unbelievable. And this man was the lackey of his Pope. And I'm not going to deal with that. And this man was maybe the same lackey sitting at the table behind the scenes. Revelation chapter 11, 9. And they of the people and the kindred and tongues and nations shall see the dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. The Bible was done away with. Secularism is going to rule the world for a time until the time is right and ripe to introduce a new theistic era. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt upon the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake and the tenth part of the city fell and the earthquake was slain of men 7,000 and the remnant were frightened and gave glory to the God of heaven. Will God stand by that the devil sets up a massive counterfeit system of religion and a counterfeit system that should herd people like cattle through Hegelian dialectic into a collective mindset 
without giving a counter? Of course he won't. They will sweep away God's word, but God's word will be lifted up. They will rise, and the Bible societies are formed, and God's word becomes prominent, although they suppressed it. And will he not have a remnant that will say, this is what the word says, to counter that which is being set up as a massive counterfeit on this planet? I believe he will. So as the enemy musters his forces for the final onslaught, so God raises the tabernacle of his truth and these two forces grow together until they will meet in the final conflict. But it is not a literal temple of stone that is involved, but a spiritual temple. God's people, based on the word, in conflict with the man of sin and his counterfeit. When Christ came the first time, he established his church, the spiritual temple, on the new cornerstone, and the wall of partition between Jew and Gentile was broken down. This new philosophy, this new religion, which literalizes the prophecies back to a literal Palestine, a literal Jewish state, are not based on the Bible. Amos 9.11, In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof. This is what we're talking about in this series. We have to repair the breach. And I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom, and of all the heathen which are called by my name, says the Lord that doeth this. And the Apostle James applies this prophecy to the call of the Gentiles. Set up this tabernacle. Satan at the time of the end will set up a counterfeit to make it null and void. But God will raise up a remnant to stand against it.